Hello, good evening. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Schomburg Library. My name is Claudia Baranowski, and I am so pleased you could join us for tonight's uh, program, uh, China and Iran's Rival Foreign Politics. For our Zoom audience, your microphones and cameras um, are turned off, but we welcome you to use the Q&A buttons and the chat buttons at the bottom of your screen. Um, our presenter tonight is Dr. Ribi Sali. Dr. Sali is a political science professor at several schools in the Chicagoland area. He received his PhD in public policies and administration from Walden University, specializing in areas of terrorism, state repression, national security, and US foreign policy. He also earned master's degrees in political science from Northern Illinois University and in international relations from Roosevelt University. He is a three-time recipient of the Teaching Excellency Award from the Illinois Community College Trustee Association and an active member of the Illinois Political Association. Uh, you may find part of his publication at researchgate.net. So without further delay, I turn it over to you now, Dr. Sali. Thank you very much, Ms. Brunowski, and thank you again for having me for this evening. And hello, ladies and gentlemen, glad to be with you in my lectures for today. Please allow me to share my screen so we could talk deeply about one of the most interesting players in the global system. This project is part of a project that I've been working on it about the tendency for hegemonic interest around the world. And back in November 2022, I presented part of these lectures at McHenry County College based on insight and experts for sharing ideas and thought. And I talk about the governing institution and the cultural revolutions for both countries and the security concerns. Now, I am looking for these two nations from two different perspectives is to understand the decisions making based on the security concerns and the rival system that's surrounding this nation. So if we take a closer look to these, <coughs> excuse me, these two nations, first of all, there has to be a better understanding for the meaning of the international system that they operate. And most of political scientists identify the international system as a multipolar system when there are more great powers competing with each other to advance their own national interest. So when China was born as a Bibo Republic of China, it was 1949 and that was when the international system a bipolar one mean two dominant powers control the outcome and that in that time was the united states of america and the soviet union now the islamic revolution of iran took place during the cold war back in 1979 and also the international system was a bipolar one when we are talking about bipolar one it's mean the world is divided between severe influences for the two superpowers. Now, the end of the Cold War came up in 1991 and the United States became the only dominant powers within the global system in that time. And that's remained for only 10 years from 1991 till 2001. Then the current system, we call it a tripolar system. And there are three major players in the system, the US, Russia, and China. Now, if you ask that yourself the question, how come China became a rising power? Now, China has a great natural resources, a great physical environment, and has been an active members for the international political economic system. And that's what makes China to be a rising power. And from there, we will ask the question, what are they looking for? 
it's, I would argue over here, the global hegemon. And the meaning of a global hegemon, it's mean a dominant powers within the international system. So while China is looking or is pursuing to achieve a global hegemonic interest, Iran, in the other hand, is looking to achieve a regional hegemonic interest since it's not a great power like China. So to examine these two things, I came up with something I use it from other political scientists. They call it power transition theory. Mean when there is a rising nation and there is a dominant nation, there is a possible confrontations between these two players. And we're going to see how this confrontation, whether a peaceful one or a hot one. So I created the following outline to trace the interest for both China and Iran within this rival system. So first, I like to examine the characteristics for these two nations, then the global perspective for their status, and how do you view the world? In other words, what is the world in their eyes? And now to understand their foreign policy, it's you need to understand how the decisions making been shaped and impacted by three levels of analysis. That's mean the surrounding environment, which is the international influences, the domestic environment, which means the societal influences, then the individual, which is mean the elite for each nation. Then I go after that to see about uh, the United States dual containment policy for both these two countries. Then finally, I ask the question, what should the US do in that matter? So we go first into the characteristics. And the characteristics in this case goes as the following. You have China. China has a great history for being an end part of the ancient civilization and is one of the oldest nations in human history. Everybody knows that. And also, it is the largest population and the largest market in the world. China also enjoys so many hundred minorities and 55 nationalities and identify itself as a people democracy and a socialist one. And it has a unitarian political system. And that's what identify itself, the People's Republics of China. China also has the four stars in, in their flag. And that's mean the working class, the peasantries, the urban bourgeoisie, and the national bourgeoisie as well. China identify itself as a people democracy since the party represent all kinds of sects of the society without having financials, barriers, or any or anything could lead for all those categories like what we hear about it in the West. Now, the characteristics of the Chinese government system and the Chinese cultural society very interesting to take it as a potential roads to understand more about China. This will lead me also to examine and to discuss the characteristics of Iran. Iran historically been known as Great Persia. And that's mean Great Persia consists the two rivers region, which is what we know it of it's Iraq now, the Gaspian region and the Gulf regions and Afghanistan. That's what mean the regional hegemon of Iran because that goes back to the old history of the Great Persia. Now also Iran is a nation of four revolutions. The first one, the constitutional back in 1911 and the oil one back in 1953 that created so many challenges for Western powers and uh, multinational corporations that they were operating in Iran back in 1950s. And also the white revolution that the government tried to adapt to westernize Iran and challenge the religious class. Finally, the religious revolution that took place back in 1979 and turned or changed the regimes of Iran. Okay, from being a monarchical one into a republican one. No, Iran also identified itself as a religious democracy because there is a combination of two systems, the democratic one and the theocratic one. 
and the religious institution is the dominant institutions for all the governing nation. Plus the Shia's doctrine is there to put it as an umbrella for all kind of sects in China, in Iran. Iran also is multi-ethnic societies. It has people from Kurdistan background, Kurdistani background, Azerbaijani background, Arabic background, Pharisee, Baluchi, and others. And Iran has been known to the region and to the world as a security, a security dilemma because it's hard to reach a reason when you come up for negotiations. Interestingly to mention, the latest development in Iran through China, both Saudi Arabia and Iran reach an agreement and normalize the relationship with them. Something the US couldn't figure it out, China was able to figure it out. Now, to understand the tendency of there is hegemon, I am gonna look for some two theories to explain to me the global perspective for Iran and the global perspective also for China. What, what's going on with their mind? How they understand the world? These two theories that what I've been suggested by the neo marxist they call it economic structuralism, and the neo-realist, they call it political realism as well. So I go with the first one. The first theory, it divided the world into three areas. The first one, the coordination, who are really advanced democratic systems, and they have the powers to control the international regimes, such as the World Bank, United Nations, IMF, and they have a great influence in global and a trade relationship. The second level over here, as you see, is the semi periphery nations. These nations economically rising, and they have been challenging the core, who are advanced democratic states. And finally, is the rest of the world. So the periphery nation that's been economically controlled by the core nation. When China was under the colonial system back in the 19th centuries, it did fit under the periphery nation. That's mean foreign power abused and used the Chinese natural resources for their own interest. This is what's make the BLA, People Liberation Army, to form alliance with the peasants and other repressed forces in the Chinese society after the collapse of the monarchy and turn against Western domination. So for China, if they are not strong enough to meet world challenges, the potential colonial economic exploitation could come up one more time to their life. So this is the only perspective they understand. Now, you look at Iran and see where does it fit with that system. Yes, the Islamic revolution was about to resistance the Western dominations in Iran because Iran became part of the periphery nations and they don't want to be part of the periphery nations. They need to take themselves into a higher level of the global economic system as well. Now, that's the neo marxist thought to understand how the economic and trade relationship works between the North and the South or between the advanced democratic nations and the none who are really not democratic one, but they have a great natural resources. Now, if you go to this side here, this is the nearest neorealist schools and identify the international system is dominated by a global power. At this moment is the United States. Long time ago was Great Britain. Prior to this was the Spanish Empire or the Portuguese Empire. Now, how this world is categorized, the realists look at it on the top, you have a dominant power, at the lower level, you have a great powers. Lower little bit, you have the middle powers. The middle powers aren't militarily strong, aren't economically strong. 
However, they could be strong, but in order to be protected from any potential abuse, they form alliance or the our one of the great power. Now you go at the lower level than the middle power, you find the small powers, and these guys could be a wealthy nation and rich, and the great powers rely on them, and therefore they could form alliance as well with each other. The last one is the weak powers, and these the powers they just gonna stay at the end of the road. Now, for the Chinese, they have they been successfully able to reach the level of a great powers. And I would make the argument that the cultural revolutions that took place back in 1960s to till the death of Mao in 1950s put the foundations for China to be rising. And China wants to be a dominant power. That's the meaning of hegemonic power. Iran, on the other hand, is still part of middle powers because of its great physical environment where in the southwest part of Asia and also close enough to the oil resources, that's the West they needed and other countries also they wanted. Plus, it's very, very uh, in, it's in good position where we have a crossroads between Asia, Africa, and also uh, Europe. So for Iran, uh, middle power is good, but to have another uh, level, higher level will be even much better. So their revolutions, the Chinese or the Iranians, it's about how to be re globally recognized by the others who abuse them. Now, since we discuss their global perspective, how do they see the world in their own eyes? Now, <clears throat> as I said in the beginning of my lectures, we have a tripolar system, meaning the you know, China, Russia, and the United States. What is the most common things between China and Russia? And what is the most common things between China, Russia, and Iran? If you look at this kind of shape that I created, and I try to understand how they view the world from three different perspectives. The first one, the surrounding environment, and we call it the international environment. And the second one, the domestic environment. Third, their own perspective as a government leaders. Now, all those, all of them agree that there is a hegemonic powers called the United States, and that's a world system order came up in post World War II and the US tried to impose it at the end of the Cold War. Neither the Russian nor the Chinese nor the Iranians are looking to play by that order. And all of them, they agree that we have one thing in common, we are anti-imperialist agent. So we share hostility to imperialism that's led by Western democracies who are looking to dominate our resources and our futures. And also, they, the West, in post World War II, created the containment policy to stop our expansion or to control us from not going to challenge them as well. So, these are the two environments added to this, to their individual thought, to understand how United States is looking to dominate the world and why they should stand it. About a month ago, I gave a lectures in this place about the war in Ukraine, and I explained why the Russian had to go to Ukraine, because they consider Ukraine a potential agent to the West to impose hegemonic expansions on Russia, which is absolutely wasn't acceptable. Now, since we have the domestic environment and the external environment and their own perspective at the world, now how the decisions making could be influenced to drive China into hegemonic interest at the global level or to drive Iran into hegemonic interest at the regional level. 
as political scientists been studying government regime, they looked at number of factors associated and could influence and impact the perspectives of the policy makers. In that case, I modified the following model after I studied for Dr. Kegley uh, Jr. and Raymond as well. So this one goes as the following. You have the international environment influences. You have the domestic environment influences. You have the elite. And I'm referring to the people who have the powers to make the decisions making. Then eventually the decisions will be taken based on number of uh, procedures. One of them, the rational choice perspective then the outcome in this case. And I looked over here, the outcome and that things, I call it the decisions and the move. What do I mean with the decisions of the move? It's mean how each player, whether Iran or China will work together or they will work for their own interest based on the surrounding environment, or the domestic environment or the thoughts of the elite. So this kind of framework give me a good way by looking and in a little bit, I'm gonna open up this framework and i touch on each one. So in the international inf influence, we uh, this characterized as there is a Western hegemon, an interest by the West to keep containing China, encircling China, militarily, economically, same thing could be applied into Iran. Now, you go to the domestic one, which is the societal influences, is Iran in this case, and China in this case, they looked at the opposition's groups domestically, they looked at their security concerns and the fears, and these could be invested by their rival powers, such as the US and Western democracies, and could be used to undermine the two regimes. Especially China has multi-ethnic society and Iran is the same. Now, you go to the elite. For Iran, the elite, here in this case, there are a small amount of people within very, very close circles inside their system. So you have the president, you have the supreme leaders, and you have the assembly of expert, which is the all of them could influence any action or they could take any decision. So I do recall back in 2009 when the President Barack Obama sent, sent a congratulations for the Nehru's holiday for uh, Iranian, he called them the leaders of Iran, did not call one person. In matter of fact, he intend the presidency, he intend the supreme leaders, and he intend the assembly of experts who are really religiously really committed, and they have the final say for everything to influence the supreme leader. Now, in China, on the other hand, we have the central committee within the Communist Party, and that believes in democratic centralism, mean nothing is going to be done at the government unless been approved by the Central Committee and the members of the Central Committee, most of those guys are very influential to come up with any decisions making. Now, this is how this framework. Now, if you take a closer look to the decisions making, so the decisions are of these procedures. First of all, in China, look at it, it's in order to counter the potential containment there and in circulations by the West. China has formed an international collaborative partnership. And that's what we just start to hear about it. They call, uh, you have to hear about it in that case, I'll uh, call it the Belt and the Road Initiatives in this one. Also, China, uh, also Iran joined that kind of partnership by offering Something we call it, I would call it friendly stakeholders relationship. Like you need me, I need you, we could be a friend together and we keep going. And that's one of the things make, China, make Iran to be closer to China because the West 
especially the United States, has been trying to isolate Iran since the end of the revolution of 1979. So the by going for some uh, challenges by the West, China, Iran is going to the East. And in that case, China will come something like this because China needs a partners and ally to keep going so it could meet the West. Although there is no physical confrontations between the Chinese or the United States and doesn't look like it, but there is kind of one thing, we call it rival system. This rival system assume competitions between each a players within the system. Now, you get also China created a move to contain the domestic challenges by adapting economic modernizations, economic reforms, and also emphasize more on foreign investment with other nations. And that was also taken in consideration by Iran in order to ensure that no potential domestic challenges as well. And I'm going to give some examples in a little bit as well. Now, you look at the elite. As I said over here, the elite is the are psychologically impacted by the colonial history and the old system that these two nations experienced as well. So we'll take each level step by step and so we could understand what's going on. The move at the international stage. And what did China or what China has been doing lately? In 2013, the Chinese president visited Kazakhstan and visited Indonesia, and he declared a future economic plan. This economic plan relies on friendly partnership and developmental peace and to honor the sovereignty of each members of that agreement. And this agreement, the Chinese model it based on the Silk Road that the West created long time ago to explore everything for China. So that we would call it the Belt and Road Initiative. And that goes from Asia, which is around China, keep going to Central Asia, keep going to some areas in the Middle East, to Africa, and also to Latin America. It's a joint ventures and economic investments between the Chinese and all those members elsewhere in the world. China is taking these guys away from Western hegemon by telling them we are partners. We are not dominators like what the foreign uh, what, what the multinational corporation or other economic establishment did in your country during the colonial system. Now, I'm moving on over here. China created a partnership diplomacy between the Middle East and North Africa. And also it tried to engage more economically with Arab states. And the biggest engagement, that's when China successfully mediated to create a peace agreement between Iran and Saudi Arabia because it needs both to be within this joint ventures in that time. And to some extent, even China successfully was able to create military bases in Djibouti at the southern at the uh, African horn in that part of the world. So what is China is doing here is creating potential economic and military allies that will make the Chinese hegemon for sure to be achieved. The other one, the two countries, Iran and China, looked at their strategic interest with each other. So for China, I am offering a lot for Iran. Since you have the oil and you have the human resource, I have the resources to modernize your economy and to help you with that uh, problems that you've been going through the, with the United States. And also you as a nation, called Iran, you are in good strategic position around the Gulf region 
in case we have potential a threat or in case we need to have a cheaper way to ensure the oil supplies comes from your region into my region as well. And I could connect the two regions, China with Central Asia with the Caspian region by having the rear roads its system and have a trade relationship as well. But China in the same token, the one to be ignored from the Caspian region, it does recognize the regional hegemon for Iran and it's over a partnership to modernize that part of the world, to engage economically with that part of the world. And that's what China sent the message to Iran. The more the West they push you, the more the East will welcome you. And now, since we understand at that international stage, we could go to the domestic one between these two countries. So Iran wants economic a bridge with China and also Central Asia and also to reach to the far east of Asia. And in that case, China is willing to provide such a support because this kind of uh, rear road corridors or this kind of tri trade route, that will be easy for them to take it to Europe in the future and they will make money. So they do not have to wait, rely on European to make money. They will ask European to pay money in case they want to be engaged with us. Plus also China could enjoy a free space traveling over the Caspian region and over Iran as well. And if one day the relationship is gonna get better between the US and Iran, uh, China still is gonna be a winner because the Iranian traditionally do not turn their back for the someone who give them the support as well. Now, moving on also with the societal stage in that case, I okay, both okay, the Chinese and the Iranian. So they understand the nuclear aspirations for each other. And they know, China knows that Iran cannot have a nuclear aspiration or cannot go nuke because the West is not gonna allow them to do that. And this is one of the things that China tries to push Iran to accept a peaceful nuke strategies where the West could negotiate with them. And that was the deals between the US and Iran during the Obama administration. And also, Iran, as I said, is okay because of the economic isolation that the United States has created on them. They start to look to the east, and looking to the east is a great strategy that's been offered by China to build multilateral agreement and multilateral economic cooperations between Central Asia, the Caspian region, China, and Iran as well. And all the time, China is there to provide all kind of civilian and technological support wherever the Iranians they want. So we are talking about kind of common interest between two rival powers to the West could be a good partners to each other and form something I call it bandwagon. So when the US tried to create a containment policy in post World War II, and adapt further resource to isolate Iran. Now, these two nations are into each other economically and technologically, and also with solidarity. And that's what they call it a friendly, a friendly allies in that moment. Now, moving on over here, the two countries, Iran and China have some concerns about the domestic issues, one of them, ethnic nationalism. So I put the two things in one slide so I could you could understand it better here. In China, since we have multi-ethnic society, if you go to the northwest part of China, you find an Islamic people called ogres. They are not Han, they are ogres. And now China, to some extent, it, during Afghanistan and Iraq, was worried about the Uyghurs might receive an external support. 
and they will break down away from China. So the Chinese, it drove its own media to the Arab world and the Islamic world and to Iran, and by telling them we are not against their Islamic belief, we are against their radicalization that might lead to break down China. And that could be have a potential support from outsider against my territorial integrity. This is how the Chinese been thinking. However, some sources elsewhere in the world accuse China for having genocide against the Uyghurs. But when we come to government politics, there is a theory called realism, and realism assume nation state needs to be strong enough to manage its affairs and is ready to meet any security challenges and that things as well. Interestingly, neither Saudi Arabia, nor Pakistan, nor Iran, and all of them Islamic giants, it tried to push China away from the ogres and seems they are okay what's going on with the ogres and the Chinese government. Now you go to Iran, Iran is multi-ethnic society, and there has been a great tendency within the Iranian society for some groups like the Kurdistanis, like the Balochistani, and like the Azerbaijanis. And for the, for the Iranian government, it's kept its eyes open in case these forces could have an external support and might lead for uh, this integration within the Chinese. Uh, within the Iranian society. This is the fear that for the Chinese and for the Iranian. And in order to overcome with these fears, they form alliance with each other, they engage economically with other allies, and they build a strong hegemon to, in order to prevent the potential threat as well. Now, you go also at the domestic level over here, both they've been facing some challenges from internal forces. For example, after Hong Kong went back to China in 1997, China adapted a special policy called, say, one country with two systems. But the Chinese don't want the Hong Kongs or the Macaus or anybody to challenge the authority of the Communist Party, and they must play by the rules by Beijing. So currently, a couple of years ago, so many people in Hong Kong accused China for state repression. And China tried to come down these protesters by offering a direct election for the city councils, the state councils, and beyond, and allow them to have semi-legislations in order to come that things down. The Chinese could crash on Hong Kong over day and night, over day and night, over day and night, like they did back in Tiananmen Squares in 1989. But they don't want to bring a global attention that China is facing internal forces that might lead to disintegrate China or might inspire other ethnic groups as well. Now, the same models of fears. You may see it on in, in Iran when one woman was arrested by the religious force a couple of years ago or a year ago, and she died in jail. And that's made the people elsewhere in Iran to protest against the regime for demanding more personal freedoms, more practices for civil liberties, and God for everyone, and God is there to judge us, not you as a government. So Iran accused the United States and accused Israel behind those protesters. And they shut down the internet for some times and kept their eyes open because any internal rival for the government regime, whether in China or in Iran, that's mean external forces behind it, that's mean the West, and that's mean other enemies for the, these two regimes. Now. Moving on over here about China and what is tried to understand and take the experience of the war in Ukraine. In the United States, until 1979, we used to have the Republic of China. It 
was the official government represent the mainland. But after the revolution 1949, we start to have a globally two Chinas. The first one, the People Republic of China, which means the West did not recognize it, especially in the United States, and tried to isolate it and to contain it. And the second one, the Republic of China, which is Taiwan, and that was considered the representative government of the mainland of China. But in, 19, in the early 1970s, the Nixon administrations, because of the war in Vietnam, began romancing China and asked the Chinese communist regime if they ever allowed them to have a negotiations with the Vietnamese and accept a peace deal with them so the US could get out of Vietnam and the entire world movement could be muted in that moment. So successfully speaking, the United States was able to reach China. And in 1979, the Carter administration recognized the People Republic of China as the official government for the mainland. And the US maintains the Republic of China as the official government of Taiwan. But the Chinese did not stop here. The Chinese called Taiwan come back home and we have one country with two systems. Now, the Taiwanese don't want to do that, but in order to protect them, themselves from any potential uh, action by the mainland, they adapted a special policy. They call it the five no's, mean we will never call for independence. We will never call for referendums. We will never change the title of Taiwan. We will never Consider, you will never consider a state to state relationship, and we will never adapt any guideline for national unification. Now, questions might come up Can China invade Taiwan? Yes. Can Taiwan stand up against China? No. Can the US stop there, the Chinese from not invading? The US could if there is an economic engagement, but China is preparing one day to let Taiwan go by itself to China without losing economic ventures because they know Taiwan has so many economic ventures from foreign nations like Japan, European countries, and the United States. And China also knows that there are lots of military bases in South China Sea and around the Koreas in that moment. But the Chinese are seeing and try to test the outcome of the war in Ukraine how this will help the Chinese uh, interest if one day we're gonna take over Taiwan and beyond. So that's one of the projects. But the Chinese, they are not gonna be irrational to go for war because they believe going to war, it has to be a zero sum game, not, not negative sum game. Now, for Iran in the other hand, we do have some concerns and that the Iranian concern is goes back to the fears of the Israelis potential military attack or military strike as a limited war at the Iranian nuclear weapons because Israel did that to Iraq back in 1981. And now Iran is saying if the Israelis try to do that, they will pay a heavy price and the US don't want to lead that region goes to physical confrontations between all those members and there has can to be kind of restraint. I'm gonna explain that in a little bit by talking about the dual containment policy. Now, I am moving to understand the elites level and who is the elite in Iran and who is the elite in China as well. Now, if we are gonna look at the government systems for China, as we have learned, there are three branches. The first one, the executive, then the second one, you have the judiciary, then you have the legislative. So with the, the executive, the presidency, and the prime minister and the cabinet, and the legislative is the National Assembly, and finally, the judiciary is the Supreme Court. Now, that's the government, but China has the party dominations over the government, and that goes as the following. As you see over here, the party in China has a national party Congress that's 3,000 persons. 
these 3,000 persons aren't a professional legislators. They are representing their provinces. And since the army members in the party, they could be a congressman or congresswoman. At the higher level of the National Party Congress, we have the Central Committee, which is the are about 200 plus. Then at the higher level, you have the Politburo, which is about 15 to 30 person. And now it's the most important one is the standing committees. And these guys, about five to 10, these guys are the elite, the influence, the decisions making, and they tell the general secretary what you're supposed to do. So that's the oligarchy in that case, or the elitocracy, I would call it. The general secretary of the party is the president of China, the People Republic of China, the one we've been hearing in the news, and he's been active as well. So he doesn't take a decision on his own. He goes back to the standing committee, and that's how the elite, they think. So the elite suggested the West tried to westernize other nations by creating and calling for democratic peace, and the democratic peace is nothing but vehicle for political hegemon. China is looking elsewhere in the world to create economic ventures and to have partnership on the principles of developmental peace, because it's Argo, most of those nations they still are in the position of the third world nation because they've been abused by Western powers, economically and militarily, and nobody helped them out. So China is saying, I am there to be your partner, and you are there to be my partner, not to dominate you, not to follow me as well. And that's the meaning of regional engagement in this case. Then also, this elite, they are under the influence of a special school in global politics, we call it geopolitics, mean each government policy is shaped and crafted and determined based on the natural resources. That's the government. Enjoy it. And the physical environment, that's the government. Live on it. On the top of this, these two resources could shape the view of the leaders or the elite of this nation. So China has a great market. So the West want me. If they want to engage with me economically, my rules. And I have a lot to offer to the world. I could travel and I could be partners. Why? The West it tried to contain me economically. And prior to that militarily, now I am free to go elsewhere in the world and form economic partnership and create one collaborative team to meet any natural challenges in that kind of system. So therefore, they sent the message, we are responsible competitors. And we are not IS nation. We are needs to be respected as a global power. And that sent the message for the Chinese nationalism. And that's where they have something to utilize. We call it power potential. Power potential, that means the government will utilize and invest at the natural resources and creating allies and forming partnership with other countries to advance their own economic, political, social interest as well. So this is the elite influence when you come to the decisions making. Now we take the same scenario into Iran. So Iran, the government system was an outcome of revolution. In China, the government system was an outcome of the revolution. So China revolution, it's a people democracy. Iran revolution, it's a religious democracy. The actors within the system those are the elite who are dedicated and committed to the principles of the revolution. So if you take a closer look with me to the government structures of Iran, so you have at the highest level is the sign of God. We call it Ayatollah, who's been dead and they are waiting for him to return. At the lower level, 
you have the supreme leader that considered the head of a state and he is nominated by the council of religious expert or what we call the assembly of expert and these guys okay about 86 person so this is the elite over here who really influence the presidency the majlis which is we call it in the united states congress and majlis over there it's a unicameral system mean they have one house like we have here two houses, the House and the Senate, and the legal system as well, and wherever come beyond. So what those guys, they are, they believe, China or Iran, we are there, work on something in common, and we have some, we share the same belief that we need to resist the unipolarity system that's run by the United States and form one collaborative team that will help us to contain and to stop American hegemon in Central Asia, in the Caspian regions, in the Middle East, or elsewhere in the world when there is kind of challenge for our national interest. And our revolutions, whether in China or in the United States, came up as a res result of Western dominations. Our former leaders were public to the West. Now we get rid of it because we are nationalists and we want to maintain our natural resources for ourselves. This is the current players in the system. You have the Supreme Leader, Ali Khamenei, and you have the current President, Ibrahim Raisi, as well. But the real powers in the system goes to the Council of Religious Experts, which is 86 people. And these guys, they could remove the Supreme Leader, and the Supreme Leader could mobilize religiously other forces to have the president step down. This is how the culture of the elite works as well. Moving on to understand the most common things between both. So when the revolution of China took place in 1949, Mao called to liberate China from foreign domination and to build social justice for everyone in the state. Same thing when the revolution in Iran took place in 1979, the, they call it the revolution of dispossessed, mean people were repressed in the name of national sovereignty, but the government was the agent of Western powers in that time. And that's where the two, okay, that's where the Islamic revolution in Iran justified any bloody action against the tyranny. And if you take, a closer look to that two revolutions, both are resistance for foreign domination. Now, that dual moving to the dual containment policy, there are two hot topics or two hot regions in Asia. The fairest one is goes back to Northeast Asia, and that start as a result of the Korean War in 1950s. And year, one year earlier, we had the socialist revolution in China and the United States had to adapt a special policy called the containment policy because they were, they give a good, the State Department give a good description for Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia as the domino theory. Mean, if one nation became in the hand of communism, the other one will follow and follow, and that's what make United States in the future in tough positions to deal with communism. So the US tried to adapt a containment policy in Northeast Asia by forming alliance with ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, and put more military bases, and this military bases will be a dual containment for all those rival powers. South Korea, North Korea, Japan, and also China as well. Now, this model of security was adapted also in Southwest Asia as a result of the Afghanistan, uh, uh, Iraq War and Afghanistan War, and prior to this, the Gulf War in 1991. So American military presence, it's in the Gulf region, it's in Iraq as a result of the Iraq War of 2003, in Afghanistan, somehow they reduced that part, but in Pakistan, 
and in Turkey because it's part of NATO. So the two countries, the Chinese, are surrounded by hostile environment, and the Shah and the Iranian are surrounded by hostile environment, and that's what make a dual security, uh, dual uh, security model, dual containment security model. It means none of those actors will engage physically with military confrontations since the United States, it's kept them away from each other. Now the question came up over here, what should the US do with China and also with Iran? Now, most of political scientists identify the rise of China as a potential a threat for American hegemon. However, other, they thought, if that could be a threat for American hegemon, we could invest on this hegemon by having a better treaty. So there are two thoughts to deal with China, the pessimistic one and the second one, the optimistic one. The, the pessimistic ones, China will keep challenging the international order and might even build more of its own powers at the expenses of the United States. So it is necessary to keep containing China. But how are you going to contain 1 billion people over there and night? Well, they are offering an economic containment, building more economic allies around the world. So if China is going to deal economically with the US, it has to play by the rules of the economic world. <coughs> the optimistic view for dealing with China has a better ideal, a better idealist point of view by saying, let's work with them. Let's talk to them. We care less if they are communist or not communist, but maybe if we could use them to contribute to the international institution, such as World Trade Organization or United, United Nations Security Council, that will make the Chinese lean. So within the State Department, there are two different approaches how to deal with China. It depends on the new president, the new advisors, the new look, and the outcome uh, that's going on with China. And I would argue from here, China is not a hard to deal with it if you do recognize it as a global power, not as a followers. And now that's will lead me to Iran as well. So in Iran, we have the following here. Iran needs to be viewed as the following. And the Iran is called, hey, we have a rich history of civilization. We are about 5,000 years old. And wasn't nice of George W. Bush to call us axis of evil as a result of September 11. And you guys, you are not even 220 years old in this system. Then Iran wants to be recognized not as a follower, no, as a sub, as a regional for sub regional system, the Gaspian one, the South Asian one, and the Gulf region as well. And also Iran wants the West to stop reducing the tone of hostility and creating the rival system by the United States. And that's why they called back in 1997-98 dialogue of civilization. And instead of clash of civilization, when the Iranian government welcomed American scholars, journalists, celebrities, uh, politicians, judges to come to see the government system of Iran. And Iran want to also see, you need to recognize my revolution, my culture, and my Islamic Republic. We called Iran as a terrorist nation. We call it axis of evil. Then they don't like that. And we call them an authoritarian system. They don't like that. They said we are a religious democracy. Your women were given the right to vote 150 years after establishment. We gave the woman the right to vote just minutes after the revolution. And we are not a rogue state that will been accused by the West or by the United States. And if you accept us, we will have stability and we will go from there. This is why Iran is not an easy 
to be understood, and that's why it's considered a dilemma. Now, I come up to conclusion with this one. Thank you for having me, and I welcome all your questions. And in this way here, I like to offer the citations for my work, which is I have to rely on it during my lecture. All right. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I'm back. Um, let's see. So I have a couple of questions. Oops. For you. Um, <clears throat> the first question in the Q and A. Is the creation of the House Select Committee on the Strategic Competition with the Chinese Communist Party an indication that the U.S. is trying to contain China? Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. absolutely correct. Okay. Now, you have got to understand two things over here when you looked at China. What is the bureaucratic system? And what is the bureaucratic system to the United States? Unfortunately, not so many of my students who try to understand the decisions making in the United States. In the United States, we have a special model, influence the decisions making for the president. We call it the bureaucratic model, meaning each government agencies will compete with each other, with other agencies to influence the decisions of the presidency. I'll give you an example. How did we end up to recognize the People's Republic of China? Everybody said Carter did that. Actually, this is correct, but the roads for Carter did not start from his administration. It started from Dr. Henry Kissinger, who was the National Security Council in Shaki at the Nixon administration. And he met with the president Nixon in that time. And he told him, you wanna get out of Shah of Vietnam? Let me reach out China. Now, Nixon in that time wasn't a secretary of state, wasn't the secretary of defense. The secretary of state were, was working on increasing the level of isolations of the, Vietnam, of the Vietnam, Vietnamese and the Chinese government elsewhere in the world. And the secretary of defense was lobbying hard inside Congress to get money for the military operations in Southeast Asia. While Nixon was waiting, for a better solution. Now, Henry Kissinger, who was advisor at the National Security Council, he wasn't in decisions to create a policy. He was there to provide a recommendation. Technically speaking, he traveled into Pakistan and from Pakistan was able to reach China and they sit in an old, old airport and they talked to the Chinese and the Chinese told them we need from A to Z and he said, I need one thing to get me out of Vietnam. And you get it. So this is the bureaucratic model, a struggle, competitions between government agencies to influence the decision making to the president. Then he went back to Nixon and he told him, yes, you could visit China and you and Mao, you could have a wine in that mine and from go from there. Then Nixon left the office. If the uh, Ford came up, Vietnam left, okay, and Carter recognized it, and that's from there. That's what we call it bureaucratic struggles. The Chinese do not have this kind of bureaucratic struggles because they are dominated one by, by one party. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that answered the question for sure. Um, so I guess this is more of a comment, um, but it is no surprise for you then that China brokered the reestablishment of a Saudi and Iranian relationship that's I yes ma'am mm -hmm. i think it was a smart move mm -hmm. by the chinese and the chinese said we are here diplomatically to negotiate between old bodies old fellows all the brothers because the Pakistan, the iranians and the saudis are islamically uh one nation and that time what the us couldn't make for the last 20 30 years the Chinese did it. And now they have, they just normalized their relationship together. And that's China, when mediate with the Iranians, the Iranians actually show a great flexibility 
to work with the Saudis, and the Saudis were surprised. So they abandoned their support them for Houthis in Yemen, they abandoned their involvements in Libya, and to some extent, they show we are not going to even go farther anywhere with supporting any militia, Islamic militia, and other than that, as long as you could talk to us and consider us as a partner. And the Saudis, they thought, okay, if we speak with them and we talk with them, we could have a better outcome than keeping isolating them. Mm -hmm. And that's what China thought about it here. China told them, I don't want to dominate you. When the US and Iran to talk, Israel interest has to be first. And so many people, they said, okay, if you want to have a better relationship between the Iran and the United States, you have to have Israel first. Now, China did that between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. Thank and that you. shocked lots of people, by the way. Thank you. Um, I have a comment uh, from the, in the chat. Uh, thank you for this very illuminating presentation. Uh, bravo. Um, and I have another question in the Q&A. In this day and age of industrial policy inside the Beltway, the CHIPS Act, and the IRA are not considered socialism as they would have been 10 years ago. Is the CHIPS Act and its focus on American semiconductor supply chain a good idea or setting the stage for conflict with China? I'll be honest to you, that has most to do with the trade relationship. I'm not an expert in this trade relationship, mm. but I'm just, I'm telling you over here, China is rising, economically is rising and you cannot isolate it. That's what Kissinger said long time ago, and that's uh, and that and they are offering. Oh, we could work with you as long as you recognize us. Now, China currently is highly modernized, highly capitalized. Where is the communism? If you remember the beginning of my lecture, I said their stars has their flag has four stars. One of them bourgeoisie. The word word bourgeoisie that's anti-socialism. You cannot have it. How come they have? So we are talking about nationalism the chinese adapted communism not because of the love communism and that's mao zedong said it's just will get rid of western domination this is it and if the west needs to deal with us we have our own rules and that's what long time ago they used to impose the rules on them and that's what emulated china and they don't want to do that so i would give you this answer forgive me for not knowing that much about the trade relationship but that's a nationalist in, uh, involvement between the Chinese and elsewhere in the world to be recognized. And that's what the Iranian they need too. And that's what the Vietnamese actually <laughs> are mostly high capitalized. I mean, Citibank is there, Microsoft is there. <laughs> so China has a special model and told that to North Korean. Hey, you could welcome foreign investment, but you put the rules. That what's the Chinese model. We are not going to allow them to come up in full force on us anything, we will force on them. Okay. Um, I, there's, uh, is there a future for the Abraham Accords? I'm not sure what that refers to. Uh, Abraham Accords, that a peace agreement was signed by some Arab countries like United Arab Emirates and Bahrain and Israel led to normalization. It ignored or did not include the Palestinians or a potential Palestinian state. And sadly, some of the Arab countries like Jordan, Egypt felt they are behind. At this moment, I don't see this peace agreement is traveling that much elsewhere in the Middle East, especially after Netanyahu created his own extremist government. And that's what we've been having we hear that in the news. In order to have a future for the Abrahamic, uh, for the Abrahamic uh, Accord, it means you need to include other party members. Other party members like Saudi Arabia, like Jordan. Although Jordan signed a peace with Israel, but doesn't look like the peace is traveling that much because they have a, no normalization. So uh, sadly, I don't see there is a future for it. Okay. Um, the China dream, you didn't mention it. How come? The China dream? Mm -hmm. Every nation in this world has a dream. I mentioned China dream. It's about increasing and pursuing its hegemon. Maybe I did not use that term dream, but I used a political science explanation. Um, I go with realism. 
Thank you. You're welcome. That is, uh, there are no more comments uh, and uh, no more uh, questions in the Q&A. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for that um, yeah, very informative uh, presentation. I, I learned some stuff. So, Happy to hear that. Man. Yes, thank you. Um, John Mersheimer, are you a John Mersheimer fan? Mersheimer. Yes, I love his reading. I love his books and the tragedy of great powers. I have it in my professional library and I read for him. He's a neo realist and I read for all those political scientists. And as well, as let me mention, Dr. Mersheimer has been a great scholar even before I was born. So I consider <laughs> myself I'm his student. Okay. I, I'm not sure if he's still at the University of Chicago or he retired or anything like that. But they uh, an excellent philosophers in political science or scholars. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay. Um, I think that's it. We're clear for questions and comments. So I'd like to thank everybody for attending our presentation and to you, Dr. Sali, uh, for joining us tonight. And uh, thank you for that presentation. So it's my pleasure. I apologize. Enjoy your evening. Meet your expectation. Have a yes, good of course. Thank you. Good night.